So the Christian industrial complex is the second pathology that I would identify for you today. The third is what I call the triumph of sentimentality. The triumph of sentimentality is uh, the idea that the world as it is, core fundamental reality, does not guide our thoughts and behavior so much as the world as we would like it to be. So I define sentimentality as the world as we would like it to be rather than the world as it is. You know, sentimentality is the first sin. It is the original sin. It was in the Garden of Eden that Satan tempted Eve by saying to her what? You can be as God. In other words, the order of the universe that was created by God you created in God's image to enjoy fellowship with God, but also to worship God, to be subservient to God, to be God's steward on this earth. That reality was not good enough, Satan said to Eve. The reality that you should prefer is that you can be as God. That was the original sin. But, you know, we see that uh, every day in the uh, evangelical church and in the world at large. You know, it's all about me. It's all about us. It's all about our wants and our desires and what we would prefer to be our view of reality. And, you know, if I were going to take you can be as God and translate that into 21st century American jargon, I would be hard-pressed to find a better translation than the title of Joel Osteen's first book, Your Best Life Now. You know, and I'm not picking on Joel Osteen. Well, okay, maybe I am picking on him a little bit. But I'm not picking just on Joel Osteen. I'm picking on myself, really, when I say this. In fact, I often tell people when I've, I've traveled around the country over the last few months speaking on a lover's quarrel, I say, listen, friends, you know, I'm not pointing a, a finger at these guys. When I want to see evidence of the doctrine of original sin, I look in the mirror. That's where I go first. So I'm, again, not picking on, um, you know, folks like Joel Osteen exclusively, but I am saying that we have to be very, very careful about how we let the order of the universe that God has revealed to us in his sovereignty through his word and through the person of Jesus Christ be polluted and corrupted by a sentimental vision of the world, the world as we would like it to be rather than the world as it is. Now, what this looks like today in, our, um, in the evangelical churches, we see, we've seen a growth in such uh, ideas as universalism, which means that everybody is going to be saved eventually, right? And, and annihilationism, which says that, well, everybody's not going to be saved, but those that are not saved will just be annihilated. Their souls will just be annihilated. They will cease to exist, and they will not uh, receive eternal punishment as Scripture teaches us. Another way that we see uh, sentimentality creep in, by the way, uh, uh, universalism and annihilationism are very common uh, within the evangelical church. In fact, many of you uh, are probably, as I was, uh, born and raised or, or, or bred in the faith on guys like John Stott, uh, who uh, have written, has written a number of wonderful books. Well, John Stott in recent years has, recent, has, em has embraced annihilationism. Uh, a lot of the folks in the emergent church have embraced either universalism or annihilationism. So uh, these doctrines are not, uh, are, are not doctrines that we don't see in the church. Uh, they're becoming more common, and they've been in the church for many, many years. We also see prosperity theology or the, or the um, uh, positive thinking uh, theology that we see with people like Joel Osteen's, jo like Joel Osteen and others. The, the, the moral of the story is, once again, I want to be clear that this is not just about personal taste, but this is about theology. Is God sovereign? Is God's grace sufficient for our salvation? If these core doctrines are true, we behave in particular ways. And if they're not true, we behave in other ways. Ideas do indeed have consequences. But unfortunately, we have succumbed to um, that quote at the bottom of the page. I don't, can you see it? It's a little, it's, it's whited out, isn't it? It's a little, little below. Well, Flannery O'Connor is one of my favorite writers. And uh, she wrote a book, a novel called Wise Blood. And she said, in the, and she gave one of her characters a, sort of a sleazy 
um, preacher named Hazel Motes who gave this line. If you want to get anywhere in the religion game, you got to keep it sweet. And, you know, that's what has happened to evangelicalism today. You know, we've, we've kind of realized uh, what Hazel Motes realized in the novel Wise Blood, that if you want to get anywhere in the religion game, you got to keep it sweet. But, my friends, this is not a game that we're engaged in here. This is truly a spiritual battle for people's souls. Number four, the fourth pathology that I see in the evangelical church today is a pathology that I call the new provincialism. You know, back a hundred years ago, most of us lived in the provinces, didn't we? We lived in small towns and communities, uh, rural areas. In fact, um, I uh, just heard some statistics recently that said today, uh, for the first time, I believe in the last year or 18 months, more Americans now live in cities than live in areas that are not cities, small towns and rural areas. And uh, that, that is a, a paradigm shift in the way we live that has been taking place literally for more than 100 years. But we all used to be provincial geographically. But today there is a new provincialism. It's what I call the provincialism of chronology. Uh, we have be uh, become geographic savants. In other words, we're very sophisticated and cosmopolitan. But we've become chronological idiots. I can tell you uh, what a Hollywood star had for breakfast today. But I can't identify uh, even basic historical figures of the Christian faith would just be one example of how we've become chronologically, uh, chronological idiots but geographic savants. C.S. Lewis had uh, identified this pathology years ago. He called it chronological arrogance, which is the belief that we are more advanced, more progressive, smarter, more highly developed than those who came before us. Um, I've heard some people give it the phrase or give it, uh, describe it as spiritual Darwinism. The idea of progressive revelation, which we see in cults uh, such as the Mormon church. And the result is that we do become ahistorical and we do become disconnected. Now, why is that important? Am I simply standing here saying that old stuff is good and new stuff is bad? Absolutely not. Am I saying that we should venerate tradition for tradition's sake? Absolutely not. Uh, the New Testament has a great deal to say about the um, uh, destructive uh, influences of vain traditions. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that Christianity is a historic faith. Jesus was not an idea. He was God became man who lived on earth at a particular time. That is what we call the doctrine of the incarnation, and it is core to our Christian faith. If we forget history, we undermine the doctrine of the incarnation. The resurrection is not an idea. The resurrection was an event that took place in history. If we do not study history, if we do not teach our children history, if we do not let the ideas of history and the lessons of history inform the way we behave today, we inadvertently, but in a no less real way, undermine even the resurrection. And if the resurrection is not true, Paul said, we are what? The most miserable of all people. Historical events are at the very core of the Christian faith. When we engage in the new provincialism, I'm afraid that we undermine these core doctrines of the faith. But you might be saying to yourself, we don't do that. I don't do that. Well, my friends, any time that we embrace that which is new, that which is hip, that which is relevant, we unintentionally, but nonetheless, in a very powerful and real way, engage in the kind of new provincialism that I'm talking about. 